A, a, it's a great honor and uh, a great challenge to be the first speaker in this meeting because I know that there is so much expertise in the range, on the range of issues that you will be discussing in the next two days. Uh, so um, I'll try to do my best to contribute to some of these conversations. Um, and I'll try to do so by coming from a, a slightly different point to where you're coming from in this discussion. Um, in the first instance, and to position this paper you know, in the broader field of media and communications, I'm coming from a very different point from where you're coming from, that of the audience. And as we know, your work within this network and within these two days is focusing on media production. However, and hopefully this will become more um, uh, evident while I speak, this is not necessarily such a different world. And even though most of us who are focusing on media and communications are used to this conventional uh, divide between production, content and, uh, and consumption, most of us also know that many of the boundaries between these three different areas have merged. And the fact actually that you are looking both at audiences uh, on, uh, on content and production shows that you're very aware of this uh, merging. So I'm focusing on media consumption and I'm um, drawing from a European uh, EU funded project similar to yours, slightly bigger, completed a few months ago, focusing on Arabic audiences of television, Arabic television audiences across seven European countries. Um, even though this project has started and the name of the project um, itself emphasizes the area of consumption, of course, and unsurprisingly probably, what we found out is that consumption cannot be seen outside consumers as media producers and even more so consumers as producers of media, or of the meanings of the media they consume. Thus, I will claim that this paper, talking a lot about uh, people who watch television and consume different media, is a necessary starting point when we address issues of media production and media content. Because I think we cannot make any claims, and they, you know, feel free to, uh, to challenge me later on, but I think we can't make any claims about media ethics, media production, journalistic practice, unless we really know actually what people do with the media that we produce or you know some of us in the room uh, produce some of us study um, before i forget um, i have a few copies of the documentary that we produced out of the uh, out of this project media and citizenship uh, they're here if any of you would like to take a copy please feel free um, I should also say that the version of this presentation is um, forthcoming in the International Journal of Cultural Studies. So um, you can see this in, uh, in writing as well very soon. So what I would like to, uh, to contribute to this conversation is to look at minority media consumption, focusing on Arabic audiences, in order to hopefully contribute to this discussion about uh, uh, culturally diverse Europe. I'm looking at the Arabic audience where what we studied is the Arab speaking audience because we wanted to keep our research open and avoid presumptions about people's religious or ethnic identity. So we only uh, 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 we started by approaching people who identify themselves as Arab speakers. However, of course, as probably we all know, sitting around this uh, room, this is the case of a very politicized uh, uh, diaspora, a very politicized transnational audience for reasons that we're aware of and which I will be mentioning briefly in a minute. And what we found out, uh, some of us uh, know that already, but also what we found out in our research is that this is not just a very politicized audience, this is not a very politicized community, but it's a very uh, media savvy transnational audience. And thus, I think this case presents interesting material, I hope, of course, biased, uh, um, uh, presents interesting material that help us understand the media world that we are studying. And I think the area of production and content and media content is part of this media world people occupy either as professionals or as consumers. So within this uh, audience, just to introduce the discussion that I will be developing here, um, we've seen a number of repeated anxieties, struggles, attempt to manage realities of their lives across different European countries. 
Needless to say, of course, we saw a significant uh, amount of diversity uh, within, uh, uh, between countries, within countries, depending on people's gender, uh, age, uh, uh, class, of course, and so on. But yet, we've seen some repeatedly uh, appearing themes. And some of these, which I will try in this discussion to organize around two discourses, one which I called strategic nostalgia and the other which I called uh, banal nomadism, become uh, uh, two predominant ways that we observed in which people are trying to manage a number of realities associated with their media worlds. First of all, the abundance of information. Uh, this group, like many group, uh, groups, like most transnational groups, have access to an enormous amount of information. It's a blessing and a curse, as we know. Um, they're very well, of course, uh, uh, aware of the discourses of exclusion, marginalization and stereotyping observed in many media, especially in national media. The case that you referred to uh, from Ireland earlier on is just one of the many uh, that we come across all the time. And of course, audiences are very, very well aware and quite sharp when dealing with these uh, discourses in the media. And another, um, a, a bigger perhaps, an umbrella area of those key contradictions is that of liberalism on contradictions, which is reflected very often in the media. <coughs> Sorry. And these liberalism uh, contradictions, as I say here in the last point, has to do with the, uh, with the interplay of different ideologies produced and reproduced in the media, or at least audiences see as produced and reproduced in the media. Um, within the, uh, uh, the context of European liberal democracy, there is, uh, there is a clear separation between the political sphere, or at least you know, these are the, uh, the values uh, of the liberal democracy, predominantly the hegemonic discourse, the division between the political and the cultural sphere, especially the division between the private and the public, what people do in their homes is not necessarily relevant to what the public life and politics is about. And then of course the contradiction that we see in the media and in mainstream politics between diversity and discrimination. We see diversity celebrated very often when we talk about you know, cosmopolitan cities, but very often when it comes to actually understanding and including uh, uh, people who are not just cooking differently, but they might have different sets of values, uh, then we see uh, some of those tensions associated with liberal democracy. All these going uh, uh, down up in a way are reflected in the, in the media world and in the political world, in, in, uh, the, in the European uh, world where uh, these people that we studied live. So um, Islamophobia, uh, I, I think most people would agree, is, is on uh, the rise as well as xenophobia for various reasons. But especially uh, communities associated with Islam have been uh, very often pathologized in the media, very often uh, stereotyped in the media, especially in relation to specific elements of their private community and cultural life. So here we see that, of course, you know, the debates about the veil, the debates about language that minorities speak, uh, the debates about what kind of cultural practices people have, when it comes to minorities, very often move away from that private world. And very often, especially uh, uh, often driven by the media, they become public affairs. So these pe uh, many of the people that we've spoken to are very aware of these contradictions. And very often they become very anxious about these contradictions. Some of the ways that they manage them come uh, through mediation, through the intense mediation of their everyday life. So they're exposed to many different systems of representation. And one of those many different systems of representations that they're uh, exposed to is that of different kinds of television. And I am making a case here about the significance of television because what we found out in our survey uh, with the largest so far, obviously it's not representative, but the largest so far uh, Arab audience across Europe, we're talking about 2,500 people 
uh, in six European countries. What we found is that television remains the predominant medium that people use uh, as a source of information. So when we talk about news, television remains predominant, though of course among younger people, internet gains territory. Um, internet and television become also merged in many occasions. Thus what we see is that even if the, uh, uh, this predominance of television is somehow changing, it is still a very significant system through which people get informed uh, about the world and they gain access to different systems of representations and systems of, of, uh, uh, of political ideologies. So these findings that I'm going to present here come from three different cities, three different capital uh, European cities where myself and my team based at the LSE worked in. These are three very different cities and of course the people living in these cities are very different as well. The research that we did included a survey as I mentioned and included focus groups and public engagement events. But here I'm focusing on um, uh, the focus groups in the different countries which were with separate uh, female and male groups based on, uh, on three age categories. And the focus groups took place uh, in, uh, in 2009, though I did do uh, a few additional focus groups while the events in the Arab world uh, were taking place, the Arab Spring, it was too good to ignore. Um, so, um, as I said, what we've seen is that many people have a lot of anxieties about trying to manage a European uh, uh, cultural and political world, which is full of contradictions, and people who are becoming uh, anxious about trying to manage all the different systems of information that they come across. What I'm doing here is that I'm trying to organize uh, some of these different forms of anxieties, but also those different forms of uh, uh, attempts to manage all these, dif uh, all these contradictions. I'm trying to organize them to within two main themes which I refer to as strategic essentialist and nomadic, or banal uh, nomadic. Obviously, not every, th every people's opinions uh, fall within those two categories, but these are the two main uh, themes that I felt become predominant in the way that people talk about the media and they talk about um, politics within Europe. I'm referring to strategic essentialism uh, uh, with refer uh, uh, reference to Spivak's invite to think about how minorities at some point should adopt an essentialist position in order to uh, promote a political discourse, in order to make claims for representation. So it's an essentialism that is strategic, it's in, uh, it gives the uh, minorities the opportunity to make claims about their representation in the society. And I'm drawing from uh, Deleuze and Guattari's discussion on nomadism, which discusses this idea of the nomad uh, as a new kind of form of identity or a, a form of identity that is becoming uh, more prominent in, in our times. And it relates to the way that people might not necessarily, to put it very simply, uh, they might not necessarily identify with the nation state, the national media, um, but they might find ways that are much more decentralized or dispersed and uh, identify with communities of interest rather than communities that they might be associated through roots and inheritance uh, and uh, the strict uh, organization of the nation state. And even though the first kind of discourse uh, appeared in the way that people tried to deal with questions of identity, citizenship, and, uh, and media, um, it wasn't a surprise that it was there, that people were thinking in an essentialist way, uh, ways. Um, the, the nomadic discourse becoming so predominant, uh, so visible, and so important for a substantial number of people we spoke to was a surprise uh, for us. And I will hopefully show some of this, um, uh, how these are expressed with reference to some of our findings. 
So let me make a, a brief reference to some of our findings in relation to four sub-themes in relation to the essentialist and nostalgic discourse and four sub-themes in relation to the nomadic discourse before I conclude and hopefully conclude in, in a way that is relevant to your discussions later on. So the, uh, I'm picking up quotations which represent a range of quotations that we observed across the transnational sample. So one of the typical ways that, uh, that people would identify would be that of uh, focusing on relations of blood, focusing on, uh, on heritage, focusing on where people come from, and ignoring these uh, more uh, formal forms of identity, citizenship, passport, as being irrelevant to who they really are. This uh, relates to that resistance, the discourse of resistance to changing time and space, um, which focuses very much is nostalgic. It focuses on the past and where we see the media in this case uh, becoming a reference, not of change, not of being informed citizens, but mostly of being uh, associated with these very bounded uh, cultural references. So in the same way, that you have a certain religion in the same way you use certain media because these media uh, reaffirm the boundedness of your identity. However, even though we start by looking at this very rigid uh, perception that includes media consumption that is, is very much bounded, then if we move on in our analysis, we see that this area is not necessarily just essentialist, thus I'm referring to strategic essentialism, uh, essentialism rather than just essentialism. In the quotation on the top, uh, where I'm, I'm referring uh, to mediated visibility, we can see a discourse of a Sudanese, a British Sudanese man, who emphasizes this kind of essentialist, essentialist discourse, I am Sudanese, my children are Sudanese, Everybody we love and is important to us is Sudanese. But I think it's important to see the last sentence of this quotation, where my interpretation, when this person says, not a single person thinks that I have been outside Sudan for even a day. My interpretation is that he's not necessarily referring to his own community, to the people within his community, but at least as well as our community, as, uh, as well as the people outside. So the, uh, the fellow citizens, the people surrounding this person in Britain or in Europe are aware that the connection is not only to Britain, but it can, because of media technologies, be primarily to somewhere else. So this is primarily a political discourse of resistance, I think, uh, more than just um, uh, closure. And of course, in the other quotation from Madrid, this becomes more obvious. Especially in the case of Madrid, but not only in the case of Madrid, in many of our, our cities, across our seven cities, we saw that people turn away both from the fear, sphere of the national citizenship, the European citizenship, and the national media, because they feel that they're not, they're marginalized, they're stereotyped, a woman is always uh, pathologized as being, you know, a veil-wearing woman who is such and such in the media. And people keep talking about this, these courses. So this kind of discourse, uh, uh, um, to summarize this section, highlights some of the, uh, of the main themes that we associate with this strategic nostalgic understanding of the self and analysis of the media by their Arabic audiences. The emphasis is on identity and on the particularistic space of identity. Thus, the discourse of people emphasizes boundedness, emphasizes boundedness and difference. But of course, this boundedness and the emphasis of difference associated with particularity is very much connected to references to the tri trivialization of cultural difference in mainstream, especially national media and national politics. Thus, it does appear very often, even though not always, as a counterposition to cultural and political marginalization. <coughs> uh, 
Let me uh, briefly refer to the other predominant discourse that we observed, that which I call a nomadic uh, discourse uh, with an emphasis to nomadic media use as well. What we see as a counterpoint to this uh, uh, emphasis to the essentialist identity, as I said, is this repetition of a nomadic understanding of people's world, of their cultural world and of their media world. So we see people saying things like that on the job. I might live here or there. I can be a million things at the same time, million citizenships, uh, no more this or that. For those of you who know uh, Beck's, of course, discussion on cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanization is like a direct quotation. No more this and that. Uh, uh, no more either or, more of this and that. And we see this person using these words. And it's not very likely that she has actually read uh, Beck. Um, this kind of nomadic uh, discourse is very much, and that's an important point to emphasize, it's very much connected to media nomadism. So the people who see themselves as citizens of the world, as being many different things, are most likely to use a very diverse range of media. And they tend to use a diverse range of media very often from a critical perspective, and I will come back to that. They do it from a critical perspective, which is quite reflexive, so people see themselves as part of the media that they consume. And they see it, uh, themselves as part of the media world, not anymore as part of a community, not necessarily as Arabs or as Muslims, but mostly as individuals. So we see this advance of an, uh, an individualism as part of this uh, 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 construction of cosmopolitan identities that can only see the media as part of this very uh, diverse and reflexive space. And even though this discourse in the first instance again might appear as escapism, I'm not uh, here or there, I don't identify with any community, I could be from Mars, I could be from anywhere, might appear as escapism, very often is associated with this last point, which has to do with a certain morality, which emphasizes um, uh, humanism, uh, uh, dependence, dependence on, uh, uh, on, um, on communities of choice, dependence on values, sharing same values with other people. What are these values? Very often, they are values associated with uh, liberalism, but also with this idea of sharing a common humanity. Yeah, I'm almost there. Um, so what do we see here? We see a transnational media consumption um, reaffirming the nomadic uh, condition. So people who identify as nomads, as I said, they are very, very likely to use a diverse range of media. Media that can be local, national and transnational. The diversity of their media use goes beyond the binaries of origin and destination. So most often these people will not just use Arabic media, Arabic language media, but they also they won't use only English language media or only French language media, but they will use an eclectic mix of, uh, of media that have different languages, uh, representing different ideological spheres and, and reflecting different national agendas. And for these people as well, it is the user, it is themselves that is on the core of their media world, not the media as such. And I think this is an important shift that relates to my disclaimer at the beginning that this is not about media consumption, this is part of the changing media environment that, that we all experience and which uh, we can see more particularly in relation to this group. <coughs> So the media world, which primarily for the people who identify as nomads, but not singularly, if you remember some of the words said among the people who identify with the essentialist discourse, um, the media world that they occupy is a world of comparing and contrasting. For transnational audiences who have access to different kinds of media, this is a way of being. You don't think about how you compare Al Jazeera to BBC. You know it because this is as much part of your reality as it is uh, you know, comparing the Independent and the Times. 
th most of these people, again, across the range of, uh, of, uh, uh, of different identification, they appear as quite skeptical and cynical towards all media. For some of them, especially for the nomads, this skepticism and cynicism is e more or less equally directed to Arabic media and Western media. But for all of them, it seems like national media, especially, and this is important for those of you who do work in the national media and in relation to your, uh, to your studies, national media, either from the Arab world or from the West, are the ones that they are more skeptical and cynic cynical about. National media, the media that they trust the least. And I think that's very interesting. All these different media being national, local or transnational, they're all elements of a single competitive environment. So if the um, you know, Irish independent thinks that this competition is uh, uh, the Irish Times, perhaps this is not, uh, you know, th they have to realize that this is not enough. In a way, Al Jazeera, Arabic competes with Al Jazeera, English and Al Jazeera English competes with Al Arabiya and Al Arabiya competes with BBC and with um, RT and so on. So we're talking about audiences that very much occupy and feel that the, their media environment includes all these different kinds of media. And while most of these people watch in national context and they're aware that they watch in national context, very often they make sense of the media in transnational and urban context. Transnational in relation to their experience of migration, but also urban in relation to the, uh, to the encounters they have in the cities where they live. And in 30 seconds, just to, to raise some of the bigger questions, I think this kind of um, evidence of the media-savvy minority audiences show this possibility at least, if not evidence, but certainly the possibility of minorities fighting back. In a way that uh, we often talk about mainstream media and national media assuming that minorities are on the receiving side, assuming that they're, uh, that they're more uh, vulnerable to the messages of national media. But are they just that? And perhaps this is not uh, 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 the reality for many people. For audiences and for transnational audiences, what we saw is that all media are subject to critique and rejection. All media. Um, the, this long uh, uh, commitment and loyalty to a single medium because of your ideology, because of uh, your national identity is changing. Of course it's still there, but it is changing. And it's changing and media consumers become much, uh, their media consumption becomes much more temporal and situated. So the national media are not anymore in the center of the discussion. Uh, they are not disappearing, of course, but certainly their hegemony is, uh, is being, uh, is being uh, challenged. And their hegemony is being challenged not only from the Americanization, not only from cultural imperialism, uh, uh, as an effect of cultural imperialism, but also through this transnational media uh, world that become part of, uh, of the European societies. But it's not only, uh, this is not just to lament the, uh, the end of national media's hegemony, but it's also an opportunity, I think, this evidence uh, demonstrates the potential value that this kind of uh, media savvy audiences uh, bring to the media world, and then national media as an effect you know, uh, can become a bit more reflexive about what they do. Thank you.